My name is Palisa Lebeko, and today I will be your co-host. I am joined by Gabriela de Guevara, and we welcome you to our inaugural Women, Be Women in Tech event. Great, so 16 days of activism against women and, child, women and child abuse happens every year on the 25th of November to the 10th of December. Earlier this year, President Cyril Ramaphosa declared gender-based violence a national state of emergency. So it's clear that gender-based gender -based violence is an epidemic in our society and something needs to be done about it. Tech can play a significant role in curbing gender-based violence. And I believe we've all seen the amazing things that emerging technology can do for us in providing solutions to our everyday problems. So the question today is what solutions do we have out there for women? And are women involved in the innovation and development process of these solutions with regards to tech? What laws are in place pertaining to technology and gender-based violence? And through a discussion with our panelists today, we hope to answer all these questions. All right, so our key topics today will be on tackling gender-based violence using technology, how technology is empowering women, and gender-based violence in the legal context and the role of technology. We hope this webinar will impact the lives of many women and allow women to feel empowered and for men to empower and support women. Please do engage with us and the panelists during this webinar. Feel free to share your thoughts and insights with us. Um, we'll ha be having a Q&A session after our speaker presentation, so you may pose some questions in the chat box. Can I just ask that everyone keep themselves muted um, and just wait for the end of the presentations before um, um, asking any questions live? All right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So. I'd, uh, I'd actually like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Amanda Mate. Amanda is a strategic planner and founder of Caucasical IT. Amanda is an entrepreneurial strategic planner, media and communications executive at Nglovokazi Online Media, a woman in str strategy, strategy engaging in and a practitioner in entrepreneurship, digital advocacy and business growth. She is an advocate and ecosystem developer for the participation of township youth and young women in the ISTEAM sectors. Through her initiatives, her initiative known as Quakazagal, she has a wealth of experience in program project and research implementation for innovation and township youth development. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Balisa. Um, good afternoon. So I'm so used to morning sessions. Um, good afternoon to everybody um, that's joined this call uh, while we celebrate or honor or retrospect an interesting time for our country for the past two to three years um, with the growth and, and, and uh, mass attention. Um, what I'll be talking about today is uh, as Kagaza Girl IT we've actually been able to merge tech and the social cause um, and bringing about um, attention to GBV causes and more so in the most simplistic way that we've gone about to, to do so. Um, so in the first starting point, I think I'm going to share my slide uh, so that you, everyone's able to see. So I'm Amanda Olmete. I launched an initiative called Kagaza Girl. We are basically an initiative designed to stimulate youth and young women from township and rural communities into the ISTEAM sector. Um, when we talk ISTEAM, we're talking innovation, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, because without technology, you can't, with, with technology, you got to think design. Um, and the two um, collaborate. And of course, innovation and tech and science all are intertwined. Um, we've run this initiative for the past three years with an impact reach of about over a thousand uh, young women and three thousand in terms of um, inclusive of high school learners to place about 60, 60 young women into full-time employment um, across the country, uh, collaborated with a number of entities um, such as Uber Technology South Africa, uh, SAP, 
um, technologies as well, um, to name a few. And we've worked across with national, provincial um, government to, to ensure that young people are not left out of what is now termed and what we all know as the fourth industrial revolution. So, of course, one of the starting points um, has been looking at how tech, and there's a video we'd like to share with you that sparked the conversation amongst the cohort for 2019, which is called the Dress for Respect. Uh, this video was uh, designed and orchestrated by Oglevy Brazil that looks at utilizing technology and the simple thing as known as the dress. Uh, three young women put on this dress and go out for the evening. And it's interesting what the data foretells. 86% of Brazilian women have been harassed in nightclubs. A partir do momento que eu falo não para você, eu acho que você tem que sair. Ele simplesmente cruzou a minha frente e me agarrou. Still, many men say they don't see it happening. Quem que vai sair numa quinta noite para dançar? Eu acho que é o verdadeiro mimimi da e tudo. So, we decided to show them. Schweppes presents The Dress for Respect. A gente construiu um vestido todo sensorizado e a gente consegue, através desse vestido, mensurar, no caso das mulheres vestindo ele dentro de uma balada, o quanto elas são assediadas através do toque. E a gente passa essa informação via Wi-Fi para uma central de controle que faz com que a gente entenda isso em tempo real e dê, na verdade, uma visão de quanto elas são assediadas. Vai ser legal de ver e de poder mostrar isso depois para as pessoas. Até para conscientizar e para tentar parar isso, né? Three women wore the dress to a party. At a house nearby, we analyzed in real time every time these women were touched without consent. The dress showed how many times it happened, the intensity, when, and which parts of the body were aimed at the most. With every new contact registered, the harassment became more visible. They were touched more than 40 times per hour. Nossa, que ridículo isso. Olha isso aqui, já chega beijando o rosto. Meu Deus. After the launch, everyone had something to say. What the data showcases is quite interesting. These young women all go out for an evening at a club, um, and it finds it finds that one of the ladies is touched almost 200 times by people she's not granted permission to. So it was a merger of sensory technology um, with a dress and just a normal, you know, as young women, we, we go out and gents as well, to not exclude gentlemen. Um, and the data came back to indicate how many times was she touched, groped uh, inappropriately um, by people she hadn't actually given consent um, or said anything to. Um, and it's quite interesting, while scary and concerning, how tech and a cause can actually bring out um, the necessary conversation that needs to be had. So as Kagaza Girl, in our next slide, when we tackled GBV, we actually looked specifically at how we can address it from the South African context. Um, and although we're based in KZN, we looked at partnering with the national entity known as Here Technologies through a community program that they run, which is the Girl, um, Girl Mapathon, that's hosted during Women's Month in August. We brought in 30 young women to look at GIS skills and look at location mapping and mapping of the country. So as I stated before, August 2019, we sought to collaborate with tech firms. Um, here Technologies being one of the, the, the partners we, we work with annually uh, through a community program that they call the Girl Mapathon. Um, in our next slide, we actually talked to the issues that we wanted to address. So it is in the time 
where there had been the Uyi Nene um, case that, that erupted across the country. And of course, there's Am I Next that erupts across social media. And because the girls are connected and the participants, part of the Chagas a Girl uh, program, are then, connect, you know, des decide to have a discussion on WhatsApp to say, what can we do? What happens? You know, and one of the things that they were toiling with was what happens when you go to a place where you're not, you don't know, you're not from the area and you find yourself stranded or you're at risk and you realize you're at risk. How do you find a way out? How do you find the closest safe zone? And of course, the girls then discussed um, a few key areas. If we go to the next slide. We looked at putting together JIS skills, um, which is what here technology has, and the actual movement and mapping of the girls. We stationed this and piloted it at Durban University of Technology to see what um, our cell phones are able to pick up in terms of movement. Now, in the next slide, we highlighted um, key areas of concern for the ladies and outlined how we wanted to address GBV using our own technical skills. Um, and those in the following slide, you'll see that these key things are actually accessible to all women. So street names, safe zones, finding one another, information about a particular area. Um, and then of course, red zones. These red zones are areas of issues or concerns and places that had Wi-Fi. Why? This was primarily because we realized that in all the areas, um, we we noticed that every for every case that came up, young women or women were being taken to areas that they were not familiar with. Um, and in most cases, they didn't know where the nearest police station was or whether the nearest clinic, the, the nearest safe house was, the nearest um, center for destitute individuals. Um, and as such, then the girls gathered to say, let's list street names in our township communities, in our rural areas. Let's list the closest police station, the closest clinic, the closest hospital, the closest library, the closest um, children's home, or the closest safe, safe haven. Um, government buildings in areas where no naturally most of us if we know when we travel and we use our whichever map you use google maps or whoever you use would note that trying to find these areas can be a bit of a challenge particularly because not every road in this country is mapped out and so for kzn we embarked on that journey to map out roads and um, safe zones for young women in the case that you find yourself in an uncertain and uncomfortable area. As a result, in actual fact, um, what happened at the beginning of this year with the government announcing lockdown, one of our girls found herself in an area where um, there was a protest action and um, of course protest action means there's a bit of a tussle between um, the community and uh, police services and there was a clash and she had to try and find a safe zone and of course communicating via whatsapp and using what had using the here maps technology she was able to find another pagaza girl um who lived in the area to direct her so that she could stay for the duration while uh, this protest action was being managed and handled again so the practicality in it is to say we know that most and almost every young woman in this country has a phone and we know that the every phone has a level of connectivity and has a level a, a, a level of navigation or mapping system and so it was important for us to try and achieve um at the cause by doing something very simplistic um that wouldn't most of us wouldn't necessarily think is important but actually is very important in terms of actually locating safe zones so in the next slide you'll see that we um Located our located key areas, and we focus specifically on township and rural areas. We found clinics, we found police stations, we found children's homes for each area. And then what we made sure to do was to list the street names, particularly the new ones for those areas. So, for example, in Durban, if you ever come to Durban, we've changed names rapidly and quite quickly. Um, and as such, that can be quite convincing for somebody who's not from Durban or even not from the, the area to be able to find um, and link through. And at the end, in the next slide, as I wrap up, 
each of the girls walked away with a certificate um, um, that lists one, their GIS skills and their contribution. We also were able to list about over 30 locations um, in terms of mapping, in terms of safety zones, safety, safe roads, hospitals, clinics, um, care centers, you name it, finding places of safety across the province. And this is an ongoing project um, that we have with the girls in which they've all created their personal profiles. Again, this was our contribution to the cause by merging technology and GBV to say, how best can we address it? We can't solve cases. Uh, we can't really work with the legal system because we're not um, attuned to that. But what we do have is a cohort of young women with skills and knowledge in the technology sector, willing and wanting to contribute. And the most simplest way was working with corporate partners like Here Technologies and of course BDO to be able to actually uh, suggest and present solutions that are necessary and bring about the necessary change. And this was not even presented by myself as the program director for Club as a Girl, but it was actually presented by the girls to say, how do I solve a problem that I could potentially face as a young woman in light of the current crisis? Um, I'd like to extend an appreciation to BDO for having this conversation um, and for being at the forefront in, in terms of corporates having the conversation and actually not just um, saying with support awareness, but actually bringing about people that are participating and actively trying to change the current, the current challenges. Thank you. Have yourselves a great afternoon, and I'll, I'll be available for questions um, at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Um, and I think this just just the, the concept here is is so important. Just having letting letting the woman in your life know that there is some there is a safe place for for her to go. Um, I think for, so often that is that is truly the the issue that we face is just who do we turn to? So thank you so much for bringing that kind of initiative into into our lives, Amanda. Um, I'd like to. Move I'd, I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Shame, sorry, Amanda, um, Dan Danielle Wright. So Danielle Wright has been doing some amazing work with a with an application called Chauffeur. Um, and I'll let her take us through that, but just a little bit of background on Danielle. Danielle worked for um, in a software sales role in Cape Town for many years before spending about 12 years in London. In this role, she learned a lot about the importance of customer service. In, in London, she worked as the manager of a fast-growing property company, overseeing the many functions that are so important to organizational efficiency. After completing her qualifications in HR management and before leaving London, she worked for, for Barclays Capital and ANZ Bank as an internal recruit in, for internal recruitment roles. Um, since she's returned to South Africa, she's focused, up on, she's focused on bringing up her family and more recently bringing Shof her to life. This is a very, very cool initiative. Danielle, would you want to take us through it? Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to BDO South Africa for inviting me to speak at the webinar. The journey of Shofu has been a very personal one for me. In 2016, I welcomed my twin daughters into this world. They joined their older brother, who was two years old at the time, and at this stage, I immediately knew I had to make their world a safer place. In 2017, I had various issues surrounding my children's needs, and the thought dawned on me that maybe there was a safer way of getting my children and their caregiver from A to B if I strapped for time or my children needed to be in two different places at the same time. My gut feel, or maybe it was my maternal instinct, said that I would rather have a woman driving them around. The idea resonated with many of my women friends for not only their children's mobility, but for their own mobility as well. And so Chauffeur, the by women for women, ride hail solution was born. The more we investigated, the more we realized what Chauffeur was needed, especially in South Africa. For me, this is not just about being another ride hail. It never has been. When you catch a chauffeur, you are supporting the woman driver in terms of safety, financial and personal empowerment. Equally, the driver is supporting the rider in terms of safety and greater personal freedom. This talks to the very ethos of chauffeur. As we have grown, we have been evolving in our thinking about who we are. Chauffeur for sure has a suite of apps and tech is the enabler. But the greatest investment of time has come in with a very personal engagement with drivers 
and personally going the extra mile to meet women's travel needs. We have a small team of very dedicated women who have personally reached out to all those who've expressed an interest to drive, coach documents required, etc. Maybe call it tech with a human face or tech with women values. We have been tracking the driver sign-on rates and for, the fact, and for a fact they rise with heightened media reports of gender-based violence. Women are looking for better alternatives. The tough economic times that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought has also increased the need for families to earn a little more. And a woman-to-woman -woman environment is seen as a better and safer option. So Chauffeur is not only aimed at providing a safer mode of transport for women, but also creating more employment opportunities. It can be full-time or part a part-time opportunity and can be used to supplement the household income, driving in your own time. Pre-COVID-19, we worked with Code Space, which is a Cape Town NGO for women, and completed a successful private beta test. Where for three weeks, a selected number of women downloaded our apps from the App Store and Google Play and were driven to and from work and to meetings and back by our women drivers. The apps for both the driver and the rider worked well. Billing, invoicing, admin portals all performed well. From this learning, we got a manageable bug list to work through. There have been a lot of success stories of similar business models overseas. A critical lesson from them is to carefully manage the rider app rollout. A scheduling-based service through a controlled release of rider apps will enable us to better manage driver supply with rider demand. This is also super critical in managing expectations of service time and delivery. We are delighted to say that even without a more publicly released set of apps, Chauffeur has completed over 500 trips through lockdown. We have been able to keep some drivers busy through scheduled bookings. As any entrepreneur will know, getting enough capital to support your vision can be challenging. We have made some great strides for sure and almost at that MVP tipping point. But we too are talking with angel investors for our next phase. Chauffeur has been very fortunate enough to be involved with technology developers Falcon Labs and marketing support Tri Advertising, who both fully believe in our offering. We have also been endorsed by Master Drive and hope to collab with them in the future. At the moment, we are chatting to a few corporates to hopefully become partners in the employee value proposition, as we believe that women employers' safety is of paramount importance. Coming back to the main topic of the webinar, we at Chauffeur started out to address an issue surrounding women's safety. We realized that there were so many other complexities specific to women that strengthened our resolve even further. We are proud of our small contribution to helping reduce gender-based violence. We might be labeled women in tech, but fundamentally in our hearts, it's about caring for people and making a positive difference in our lives. Technology simply enables us to be a bit smarter about how we go about this. In a nutshell, Shova is a platform where women drivers can become entrepreneurs themselves. Over five, Women have registered through our website, with about 75% being new to ride hail. Women drivers prefer women riders. Women riders prefer women drivers. Many women have the principal responsibility of getting kids to school and various other commitments, and so require flexibility to work on their own terms. Many who might otherwise have more complex public transport needs or who, or who might not travel now would now have a better alternative. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that presentation. It's wonderful to know that there are solutions out there that are being championed by women for women that are, you know, trying to protect women in such trying times and giving women solutions or options to be more in control of their lives and their safety. Next up, we have um, Dondi and Samantha. They will be co-presenting to introduce um, our, our two speakers. Samantha is a research associate with the Aethan Society Research Unit, and she graduated with a master's in public health from the Division of Social 
and Behavioral Sciences in 2019. Her research interests include digital health rights, sexual and reproductive health rights, and maternal and child health. Mutondi is a law lecturer and PhD candidate at UNISA and WITS respectively. Ms. Malaudzi holds an LLB and LLM. Her research interests include human rights litigation, legislative, legislative drafting, law and gender. Ms. Malaudzi and Ms. Malunga are both members of Feminist Ingba African, which is a community and network of feminists across, across Africa and the African diaspora, organizing on digital platforms seeking to establish and establish safe collaborative spaces for feminist conversations and solidarity. FWA is a part of a collection of civil society activists, technologists, policymakers, researchers, and feminists who submitted a written, written comments in response to the Domestic Violence Amendment Bill. Um, our two presenters today will be speaking on understanding the evolving context of domestic violence, ICTs and emerging technologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Palissa, and thank you so much, BDO, for inviting us here this afternoon. Um, as Palissa said, my name is Mutundi and my co-presenter's name is uh, Samantha. Our topic today is understanding the evolving context of gender-based violence and the legal responses to this evolving context. Increasingly, online gender-based violence is being perpetrate, per perpetrated through the use of ICTs and other emerging technologies. I always use this to explain the shift that has occurred in recent years, and this is something Samantha has probably heard me say over and over again, and even though she's sick of hearing it, I'm going <laughs> to um, say it again, is that the, we're living in a context where the perpetrator of online harms looks different. Um, we no longer live in a world where in order to perpetrate online harm, you need to be a tech savant hacker in a basement with six computer monitors in front of you running code. Um, anyone who knows how to use a basic smartphone can cause real harm, and there is therefore an increased need for legal responses to this changing context. And that's what Samantha and I are here to discuss today. Our presentation will be divided into two. Um, Samantha will present the growing context of gender-based violence in an online context, and I will discuss the legal responses, as well as some of the work that we have both been involved in. So, Sam, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. When I talk about gender-based violence, I mean any act that results in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to a person. So this includes threats of violence, coercion, or deprivation of liberty, whether it's occurring in a public or a private space. South Africa has been facing a GBV epidemic for a long time now. One in five women have experienced physical violence at the hands of their partner. This has worsened during lockdown with survivors being forced to stay indoors with their perpetrators. The government GBV and Femicide Command Center alone recorded more than 120,000 victims in the first three weeks of lockdown. With the rise in digital tech has also come a rise in online GBV. With 53% of the South African population having internet access and generally low digital literacy rates in older populations, this leaves a large portion of the younger generation being the ones most active online and therefore more likely to fall prey to the online GBV. Can you go to the next slide? There's various examples of online GBV. Um, the next slide. There we go. Um, yeah. There are various examples of online GBV, which include Surveillance that's being watched on digital platforms with accompanying threats based on the acts you committed while being surveyed. Tracking and monitoring. This is when spyware is used to collect one's location information. Controlling devices. Um, for example, when it's used to induce paranoia in another person by hacking their Google or Alexa home app and switching the lights in their home on and off incessantly. Online harassment. Persistent abusive language targeted to shame and silence a person. Direct threats. 
This is a message communicating acts of violence to a person and malicious distribution of identifying information and non-consensual intimate images and audios. This list of examples is not exhaustive. The conduct I mentioned humiliates, degrades, or otherwise violates the sexual and bodily integrity of a person. These harms and the descriptions associated with them need to be understood within the context of the rapidly developing online space. Digital technologies and the, and the internet have become tools in which domestic violence, harassment, abuse, misogyny, sexism, racism, homophobia, and transphobia are amplified. The rapid increase in online harms or harms facilitated or aggravated by the internet and social media is indeed a practical challenge that has grown increasingly prevalent over the last two decades. Globally, about 73% of women have already been exposed to or have experienced some form of online GBV or cyber violence. However, I must note that I'm concerned about the lack of research that would help us and policymakers in understanding the breadth and depth of these issues in our region and in South Africa in particular. Next slide. Digital technology solutions to online GBV have begun to emerge over the years um, as a response to mitigating harms caused by online GBV or cyber violence. And in times like these, they play a much needed role in helping people trapped in harmful circumstances. There's numerous tools, but I'm going to highlight two that are being used in our region. The first is Rainbow, and this is an AI powered smart companion that helps victims or survivors of domestic abuse to understand their rights, recognize abusive behavior and access justice. It works through Facebook Messenger, so it's not easily detectable, which is a useful characteristic for an online support space since some victims or survivors have their internet use monitored by their abusers. And so having an internet history that reflects Facebook Messenger wouldn't tip off the abuser to what the victim or survivor would be doing. The second app is called the Noka Neng app, and it's used in Lesotho. And it enables women to watch, read, or listen to information about different forms of GBV and their consequences, as well as services available in Lesotho and the laws that protect women and girls against violence. Users can also connect with professional counselors for advice and use the virtual space to share their stories and support others. The Sexual Violence Research Initiative came up with the following guidelines when, you, when we're thinking through how best to create a GBV support app. Tech is not a replacement for conventional approaches to advocating against GBV. It needs to be complementary. Tech should be developed alongside end users or people who are intimately aware of experiences of end users. So people who've come out of these situations and can inform developers on what aspects of an app are most important and will impress on them the need for responsible designing. For example, an app that's not used in our region but is used by women in, certain, in these kinds of circumstances in the US is called the Circle of Six. It's designed to look like a social media app. So if it's used in the presence of an abuser, they won't immediately be aware what the person is using it for. Lastly, a support ecosystem should also be a part of the tech rollout during GBV interventions. Digital solutions to GBV, again, as I said, need to play a complementary role to GBV resources on the ground and not stand alone. So for example, though one support, though, though that you can get online support through the app, it would be helpful to also point out options a person can access physically like the nearest to Tuzela Center, a halfway house, or support group. Can you change to the slides on digital inequalities? I must emphasize, however, that these digital solutions are not accessible to everyone. Since there's a definite rural urban gap in accessibility to digital technology because of the cost, the availability of hardware, and the range of the network, and lastly, reduced rates of digital literacy. I'll now hand over to my co-presenter. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sam. Uh, I think COVID has really taught us a lesson about the importance of internet rights and freedoms. And I think we're going to see a growth in this as a human rights cause. This will range from movements on closing the digital divide as discussed by Samantha, and making internet rights and freedoms accessible to everyone. 
but at the same time coming face to face with the harms that are caused by um, people who use emerging technologies to perpetrate such harms. <clears throat> Now more than ever, lawmakers, legislators, and people in policy are trying to find ways to come up with and keep up with the human rights and emerging technologies. So the concerns associated with the occurrence of online harms are more real now than they ever have been before. Yes, the internet is our friend because it is proven to be an important tool for social justice, but it is also our foe because it has been used as a tool for harm, particularly in the area of gender-based violence. Next slide. There has been international recognition of the impact of emerging technologies in a gender-based violence context. In a 2015 resolution on eliminating domestic violence, the United Nations Human Rights Council recognized that the act of domestic violence includes, in, includes cyberbullying and cyberstalking. Also, the Commission on the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women recognize the power of digital technologies in empowering women and girls, including for access to information, yet at the same time has encouraged states and lawmakers to combat the use of technologies to, to perpetrate violence against women. So this is a fast growing area of law, both locally and internationally. Next slide, please. So the questions we then have to ask are, what then is the role of the law in this context? What are some of the competing rights that occur when coming up with legal or policy responses to emerging technologies? And what are some of the balancing exercises that we need to take into consideration as lawmakers and policymakers in workplace contexts, particularly with the new shift into an online workplace environment? In the most simple and straightforward terms, the role of the law in this context is to ensure that victims or survivors of GBV are protected from the harmful impacts of ICTs and other emerging technology, but also to ensure that strategies for the protection against online harms do not inadvertently cause further harm. As a starting point and for purposes of our conversation today, I have chosen three factors that must be kept in mind when reimagining GBV laws and emerging technology. These are some of the factors that I think we need to have an understanding of as individuals who exist in a society where online GBV is a reality. Um, this is something that I think we need to consider as activists, as lawmakers, and anyone else who's working in this space. The first that I've decided to discuss is inclusivity and intersectionality. And I personally feel that this is one of the most important considerations. Responses to online GBV need to have the widest possible understanding of how online GBV plays out in different contexts and for different people with different realities. This means having an understanding of the reality of Black women, of gender and sexual minorities, of women in rural and urban areas, of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, etc. So when we come up with solutions, we need to have an understanding of these different contexts and to make sure that we are one, not ignoring specific groups of people or placing some people and their needs above others. And lastly, not causing further harm to particular contexts or experiences. A good example of how the failure to be intersectional and inclusive may play out is in the context of anonymity policies. I consider these the poster children for competing rights because when discussing anonymity, you have various competing interests and rights. So you have to undertake a balancing exercise to make sure um, that people are protected against online harms, but also that you're upholding rights to privacy and the right to freedom of expression. Anonymity in an online context is of the utmost importance, not only for exercising the right to freedom of expression, but also for the protection against the discrimination and harms that may flow from it. It is an effective tool for social activism and for the protection of at-risk communities. The other side of the coin, however, is the potential to harm as perpetrators of GBV often use anonymity to engage in abusive behaviors. And this is why when we look at uh, anonymity and we discuss solutions to anonymity, um, the suppression of anonymity is not necessarily the correct response because suppression cannot pass the test for intersectionality and inclus inclusivity because through an intersectional lens, a suppression approach to anonymity may cause further harm. An example of this is the importance of anonymity for gender and sexual minorities 
and the potential of outing someone if that anonymity is exposed, or even the outing of human rights defenders who need anonymity to, to operate when operating from conflict areas. This is why what may seem like an obvious response to locating perpetrators of online harm may be a problem if not properly regulated. This was highlighted in an APC report wherein they discuss Facebook's 2015 real name policy that exposed transgender people, human rights defenders, and even victims or survivors of gender-based violence. The second factor I want to highlight is the importance of language. I think it is of the utmost importance that we make sure that we are using the correct language so that when we do adopt laws and when we do adopt policies, we do not further perpetrate harms in the language we use. Because adopt adopting laws and policies with the wrong language will pose issues for interpretation that may be harmful. So for example, the mainstream use of the term revenge porn, rather than using the more appropriate and the more accurate, the non-consensual dissemination of intimate images. Using the word revenge may create an opening for questions like, but what did the survivor or the victim do that resulted in said revenge? So it has the potential to establish implicit blame in the victim or the survivor, and it also takes a step into the arena of sex work, which is a consensual commercial contract context rather than gender-based violence. It is thus important for us as policymakers and lawmakers to adopt the correct language. This is not only something that I think is, is, is sort of a warning for the legislature, but also something to take cognizance of in workplace policy environments, for example, where tech is often used to perpetrate GBV in the workplace. And lastly, I want to discuss the independence and specialized, the importance of having independent and specialized regulating mechanisms. When I speak of regulating bodies, I speak not only of the court systems, but also of disciplinary workplace procedures. Uh, for example, um, the, we are going to increasingly require a need for an understanding of online harm as we shift into online workplaces. We need judges, magistrates, disciplinary panelists with the expertise on online harm and emerging technologies in order to ensure that the laws and the policies that we have in place are properly interpreted in order for them to achieve their objective. It does not help to have these well-drafted policies if when I, Tundi, for example, report a case of harassment in the workplace, the panelists sitting on the disciplinary board that have to take decisions have no understanding of, for example, how consent works in an online context. You can change to the next slide. And then to close off um, my presentation with Samantha today, I thought we would discuss the amendments to the Domestic Violence Act, which were introduced in 2020, and just briefly go through some of the submissions um, that we made. The purpose of the amendments has been to enhance the application of the Domestic Violence Act to protect victims or survivors of GBV and other vulnerable persons against domestic violence. Um, in October 2020, members of the FWA along with ICT Africa, the Association for Progressive Communications, and Alt Advisory made submissions to the Portfolio Committee on these um, proposed amendments. Some of the issues we sought to highlight to the committee included the absence of research and data on the prevalence of the types of online harm, the understanding and balancing of the use of ICTs as supporting environments for victims and survivors against harms caused by ICTs, and also the use and understanding of the right to privacy and data protection principles in a domestic violence uh, context. So, for example, one of the things we asked for was the expansion of the definition of harassment in the amendments, and we urged the Portfolio Committee to provide for digitalized environments and to reflect violence that occurs online. So just to close off, and with all of that said, I think it is important to always remember that the law does not exist in a silo. And as people living in South Africa, we know better than anyone, and we understand that the best constitution in the world and the best legislation in the world is not a catch-all solution to all of our problems. Activism and law must work together in order to ensure the best results. In order to ensure that we have the best results and to ensure that um, emerging ICTs um, uh, assist us in the fight against GBV rather than con um, causing further harm. We must always make sure that the approach is an inclusive and inter an intersectional, intersectional one in order for it to be effective. 
Again, thanks so much to BDO for inviting us to have this important conversations and we're here to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank for, you. For you. That. Um, I think what we'd like to do now is just kind of open the floor up. Uh, we'll open the chat up to to some questions while we while we wait for that. Palessa, um, I think we do have a few questions we wanted to pose to to our speakers. Do you want to take us through one or two of those? Or I can. Um, that's that's no problem. Um, great. So in terms of in terms of um, what we've what we've heard, I guess to to anyone in the um, on the panel, uh, what do you kind of hope to be seeing in tech, or what do you hope to be seeing tech used for in the future to better help the the lives of women and children? Um, is there anything else that you would like to see kind of? Grow out. I know personally on my side, I'd love to be some, seeing something more like Kukazagol, um, pretty much across the board, especially within South Africa. There are so many places that need it. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, ladies. I think um, I see Melissa Slaymaker saying cheaper data. I think that's that's the first starting point. Um, I love Sam, Sam's and Montondi's perspective on the, the, you know, the legislation of emerging technologies, and that's true. Um, the international conversation is AI and AI and racial profiling, um, the risks that are involved in terms of that. Now, you know, AI has a security benefit, but it's, there's also the risk benefit. Um, and, and in that, one needs to consider how do we upskill the entire country and prepare them for the use of this technology. Um, we're talking automation um, and one of the biggest things we realized is we've taught the girls everything in terms of skill, in terms of tech, in terms of being on par with the rest of the world, they are now global citizens. But the downside of that is the social skills that make you human lag behind. And until we're able to merge, and, and, and really touching on Motonda's point on activists and the League of Fraternity need to collaborate, it's the same in terms of tech. Um, you need to collaborate with your end users, which is why I love Danielle's work in, in terms of women feel safe with other women, women feel safe with other female drivers, and it's understanding your user or the users of the work that you do, which is critical. So we don't design the program. The, dis the program was prescribed by the girls uh, in, in a focus group session where they said, this is what we need. And I think it's critical that we do that. And again, they've always highlighted cheaper data, completely agree. We um, really do need cheap data in this country. <laughs> um, and of course, again, there's this beautiful TED talk that says, shut up and listen. Sometimes it's important to just step back and allow the people that will use your tech or use your services to be the ones that tell you what the problem is and then solve that for them. Absolutely, 100% agree with you there. I think most of the ladies in the chat are saying the same thing. Um, I'm also kind of seeing a highlighting here of just, you know, the need for further infrastructure. I think a lot of people are struggling with just getting access to a cell phone at this stage. So, um, you know, let's let's tackle let's tackle things one step, a step at a time. And unfortunately, it's a kind of it's a kind of problem that we we can't. Um, we we need to try and hit it wherever wherever we can possibly. Um, manage to to bring any kind of relief solely because it is such a it is such a heartbreaking problem um i see i see our fearless leader <laughs> our fearless fs leader has a question pierre do you want to share something with us thanks gabby i'm not so sure about the fearless part but nonetheless um i think thank, thank you for a, for a great presentation ladies i said, it actually makes me angry, sad and depressed at all at the same time when you see these stats and you've got to ask yourself why, why do people do this? And maybe that's a conversation for another day. It's just it infuriates me. But, but nonetheless, um, a couple of months ago, we had a hackathon for some of our BDO FS um, technology students and one of the groups were working 
on an app that you have on your phone. Now, I, I get the whole thing about cheaper data and, and the lack of always connectivity, and I understand that. But nonetheless, they worked on an app, I think it was for Brazil, if I remember correctly, in, in, in the, the slums over there. But the, the effectively be a, an emergency or panic button on your phone. And if you then have any a situation of gender-based violence where, you know, it's private, it's confidential, but hopefully it'll get you help quickly. So it's a direct line to certain uh, a certain group within the police or the SAPs, but also to a, another support center. And uh, then not only does it get reported and it's there forever to follow and trace um, to ensure it doesn't fall on death ears or get forgotten, first and foremost, but secondly, it also helps that hopefully help will be available and get to you quite quickly. Is that something which potentially um, the right people, I don't know who they would be, can consider to implement to and build and develop to support and help gender-based violence victims in South Africa? I think it's definitely something that's been considered before, Pierre. Um, I think it's also just like, like Amanda was saying, or it doesn't even necessarily need to be SAPS that kind of comes to your aid, but it's just someone close by. So I definitely think it is a possibility and it's definitely something worth looking into. Um, maybe we can have that as a, one of our one of our goals for our next um Either our, either our next webinar, either maybe maybe we as women and take hold our own hackathon and uh, maybe get something like that going. Um, maybe reach out to Danielle for some some help on that on that app development. Hi, um, and Gabriella, can I just um, jump in here? And um, Pierre, so we've been talking to um, a company that does exactly that. We we were looking for some form of SOS um, button on our app to um, connect our drivers and our riders with um, with um, armed response units. And we were actually we successfully talking to a company that um, have signed up all the armed responses um, in the country, and they are linked to a, um, a call center. Um, so that's definitely, definitely out there and on the cards. Oh, that's fantastic. I hope something like that can really take off and, and support the society as a whole. That would be amazing. Absolutely, for sure. Um, I think, Palesa, we, we had a we had a really um, good question earlier on in the comments. I don't know if you want to introduce it. I'm happy to as well. Yes, okay. please. Um, you may do so. Um, so, um, so, basically, so, go for it. All right. Uh, so, the question was from Nyandala Ramaru, and uh, they are asking were there any considerations into the fact that making apps exclusively for women can allow for easy targeting? What could be the safety precautions preventing other genders from accessing the platforms? I don't know if our, uh, if any of our speakers have kind of thought about that. I think um, you know further further down the the chat there was also um, somebody mm -hmm. pointing out the fact that maybe we can start using um, certain AI features on some of these applications to kind of make sure that the people actually using these uh, these apps are are genuinely women and are not. Um, are not using it for the wrong reasons. Um, the question that I really enjoyed. Um, Earlier on in the chat was just basically how we how we balance freedom of speech and, and sexual harassment on in in line with online platforms. So I mean, I mean as a woman we we're, we're obviously pretty privileged um, privy to all of the different things that get said online about uh, female bodies, female actions. You know, um, a lot of victim blaming. So I guess the question is, you know, where where is the line in terms of what's allowed to be said and what isn't? Um, Tondi, I don't know if you have a if you have a view on that, or um, is that kind of is that kind of the whole risk around um, GBV versus just freedom of speech on on the internet? Um, I think the I mean it is a bit, it is a bit of a tricky one and it is a bit of a complex one, and I'm happy to elaborate more on it. But just a, a short answer to that is that you must remember that in 
South Africa, freedom of expression is not an unlimited right. So you don't, just because you have the freedom of expression doesn't mean you can go online and sort of say whatever you want, right? Um, when we are looking at freedom of expression in South Africa, we're looking at it in the constitutional context, in the context of Section 16, which actually gives um, limitations to how far your freedom of expression goes. It's not an absolute right. So obviously, if you are dealing with, from a legal perspective, if you're dealing with sexual harassment versus freedom of expression, I think if a balancing exercise is undertaking, obviously, depending on the case, because it is dealt with on a case by case basis, you will find that the protection of, of, of victims or survivors of gender based violence um, in the context of online harassment will sort of take uh, will sort of take uh, priority in that context over the right of freedom of expression. So I think that's sort of like the simplest way to answer that. Of course, it is a lot trickier than that in real life. We all know that accessing the courts and accessing sort of the legal solutions that do exist in that context is a bit trickier in, um, in reality. And that's why I mentioned regulatory bodies. Um, because when you do go to the police station and you want to report such things, or you do, um, you, or you are even going into the magistrate's court, for example, DV cases, and you've got a magistrate in front of you who doesn't understand online harms and how they play out, who doesn't understand what consent means, who doesn't understand how these platforms work, and doesn't understand GBV and technology, then you're not going to get the solutions you want. So that's why that was one of the factors that I specifically discussed, that it goes beyond just the right. It also goes towards having the correct people in place to deal with the solutions to these problems. So that's sort of the simplest way to look at that. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, I think we're running over time a little bit. So what I think what we'll we'll do now is just basically um, put together some of the some of the questions that we've been um, getting on the chat and any other questions that um, the the attendees have been kind of curious about. And what we can do is just basically circulate um, some some answers that we've gotten from our panelists to, to to share with you. I'd just like to say thank you so much for for our speaker to our speakers for for joining. I think it's been an incredible experience just listening to all of the amazing work that you are that you're doing and just the insights that you have are so so incredibly important and powerful. So so thank you so much for joining us. We've enjoyed every second. And um, yeah, in terms of in terms of questions, we will definitely get some of those answers through to to our attendees as as soon as humanly possible. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you everyone for attending. Um, as our first webinar, and with this many glitches, we feel incredibly fortunate that over 200 people have joined today. So thank you so so much. <laughs>